if you're in business, you're in business of behavior. And I cannot think of any other industry that is more about people than events and hospitality and tourism, right? So even if you are a seasoned event professional, you have to learn more about human behavior and mind if you want your job to become easier. And I can assure you that science-based solutions are very low key, but high impact. Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Keynote Curators Podcast. I'm Seth Deckman, your Keynote Curator. Our guest today is Victoria Mate. Victoria, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. It's a true pleasure to have you. I'm very interested and equally excited to dive into your expertise, which really delves into the depths of the human mind. I think in today's world where we have artificial intelligence, the technology in our hands, doom scrolling, uh, all these distractions digitally, understanding the human mind is so important. And specifically for many of our listeners, how we can leverage that understanding within the events industry and how how that can have a positive impact our understanding of you know how the human mind works and human behavior works given i'm the keynote curator and i i mostly deal with keynote speakers i deal with some event strategy and some some methods of capitalizing and leveraging keynote speeches the best with initiatives and messaging at events but given your background and your expertise victoria how do you get speakers and event professionals to prepare the material, the message, their presentations to be more brain friendly? Right. Thank you for this question. I think it's a very important one and the one that is often overlooked because event organizers often assume that speakers, especially seasoned ones, know how to engage an audience and on the brain level as well. It might be true in some cases, but you don't want to leave it to chance, right? And you also have to make sure that content resonates at a deep brain level. And I believe that content is not presentations or sessions. It's not just about passing along information, right? It's about delivering content that sticks in people's memories connects emotionally, contributes to behavior change, right? And to do that, you need to understand what helps and what hinders audience involvement, engagement, what creates this connection between a speaker and an audience during a keynote or any other session. And um, there are things that are out of speaker's control and more within the organizer's control, but there are many things that speakers can change to improve outcomes and present themselves better. But again, I recognize that they are not necessarily experts in the neuroscience of learning or in behavioral science. And I believe that the responsibility, big chunk of responsibility lies with the organizers to brief speakers and help them learn how to make their content brain friendly. And, you know, some, some of the examples and mind that, that it's not about big changes. It's in many cases, it's about small tweaks that can be even more powerful. So a couple of examples that I um, can share, um, take slide design, right? It's 2024 and we still see a wall of text. And the recommendation here to make it more brain friendly would be to use minimum text because people cannot use two sensory channels simultaneously. So basically, if they have to read a lot of text while you talk, they will not hear you, right? And this results in the recommendation of opting for less text over more text. And it's, a, again, simple tweak, but it's going to lead to powerful results about how audience perceives your content and your presentation and your slides. Another example, opt for and insist, if necessary, for 
on having a shorter um, session. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember times when we uh, had keynotes or other sessions that went on for one and a half and two hours. Crazy, right? And now we've got we've got it under one hour, probably. It's more of a standard, right? And I believe it's because, not because the attention spans, as some say, getting shorter, no, no, but because more organizers have a better understanding of how it hurts people in terms of learning and overall satisfaction. And another example here would be, there was a study that tested various Zoom backgrounds. So if we're talking about online events, they found that speakers are perceived as more trustworthy and competent with books and plants in the background. Can you imagine? So I think briefing speakers and giving them tips that are research-based is the way to make their impact and their content more effective their impact stronger. So it's a win-win all around for the audience, for the speakers, and for the organizers. Yeah, those are some great tips, and that's all science-based. Is there anything, um, you know, some of them are practical tips where the wall of words, I like that phrase, where, you know, look, less is more. And it's true, I, I guess, as you're saying it, I'm no scientist, but neurologically, the wall of words displaces our attention and now they're no longer hearing you. They're having to activate reading, which is a whole different neurons are firing or I'm making up my science understanding a little bit, but the attention is, is displaced or redirected. I think it's less and less these days, but it still exists where it's a crutch for speakers and we're asking Look, I, I tell speakers, it's not enough just to wash people over with words and video and sound and some nice images. But really, you know, today, the keynote speaker has so much more value and in turn more pressure. And when we're preparing the keynote speakers, it's not enough to tell them the mood, to tell them what's going on in the industry or the specific organization they're presenting to. A lot of those is data and we need to inform the speaker of that, but they really need to be in tune with a shorter presentation these days, sometimes even 30 minutes and less is more meaning words are phrases are minimal. Videos are shorter. Sound clips are shorter. And even the amount of slides, if there are a lot of them, they're quick images, and we're not inundating our attendees with a lot of extra work because they're coming from a place of listening to what's being said so that they can understand it and have something stick so that they can take it away, apply it immediately, and have an area of their work or their life or both transformed and have that last over time. And this, this is so important for both the speaker and the event planner or anybody that's involved in, in dealing with speakers at events to understand. And I, I think that's a little bit of what you're saying, Victoria, no? Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's a perfect summary. Yeah. Thank, well, thank you. You know, I'm interested, um, you know, we see the word economic behaviorist, you know, economic behavior being studied, even sociology in any industry, really, to understand whether it's generations, cultural norms, or how to best approach uh, an idea and, and bring it forth. I'm interested, you know, what, how did you become, you know, a humor behaviorist in events? I have always been interested in psychology and it started as a personal interest and passion of mine. And then when I went to my first university, I studied um, psychology there as well. And I wrote the thesis in cognitive linguistics. And then uh, throughout the years, I was just interested in learning more about human behavior and mind. Then I got into events and, um, I always say, you know, it didn't uh, come to my mind immediately that there is this connection between events and psychology. But at some point, I realized that we don't do enough in events to understand how how people work because we are experts in all other 
things and all other elements of event design and event marketing, but we don't really apply a lot of insights and a lot of findings from sciences like neuroscience, psychology, and behavioral science to improve event planning, to improve experiences. And this is where I realized that it's a niche that I'm very much interested in. It's a field that I can develop, and this is how it started. It's so interesting. You attend so many events. I do too. I just came from one. And there is a psychology to it. The attendee, the the stress, the anxiety, the excitement, the uh, boredom. There, there's all these emotions. I've seen this before, the kind of routine. Oh, this is something new. I don't know if I like it. The seating is different. What is this property like? What is this convention center like? Oh, the name tags didn't used to be like this. Oh, they switched it. They used to have the general session in the morning. Now it's in the afternoon. They used to give us breakfast. Now they don't, or they never did. And now they do, you know, and then the event planner, the psychology behind it, you know, you're shooting for good reviews, good comments. You want to hit the bullseye with regard to what your aspirations are as far as educating people, informing people, having them network and connect. There's a lot of moving parts. What would you recommend to an attendee, an event attendee, how to, how to maximize their participation, their time investment, mm. their overall okay. investment with everything that's going on, busy schedules, distractions, a new place, the travel, am I going to go to the right session? That There's a lot of uh, mind escape there. Mm, what do you recommend? Right. So for the attendees, I actually believe that, and I always say that events are a two-way street. Of course, you know, the biggest chunk of responsibility lies with the organizers about how experiences go. But attendees are also responsible about making maximum out of it, right? Because if you don't prepare before attending an event, if you don't do your homework, then your outcomes could be worse. And what I mean by homework is that uh, you need to... um, learn about who's going to be at that event, uh, what your goals are, think that through uh, in detail, and be mentally prepared for what you are going to do at the event. And again, uh, a lot of the times uh, people get overwhelmed at the event because the environment naturally is overwhelming, right? There are a lot of people, uh, a lot of novelty, bright lights, crowds, noises. So it's sensory overload, cognitive overload. And you need to keep that in mind and be mindful about how you uh, break down your time at the event so that it becomes the most effective time. Because event happens, you know, within one or two days, right? So you, at the same time, you want, as an attendee, you want to uh, get a maximum out of it. But at the same time, you have to remember that if you are going to chase every single thing at the event that you planned, then you get fatigued, you get socially exhausted and this is not going to um, serve you well right so you need to plan your event carefully and reserve time for breaks reserve time to take care of yourself mentally and physically so these are some of the things that i would say attendees should keep in mind first yeah those are great tips i mean you know reading the agenda taking a look at the map, your location of the hotel, so that you can anticipate and and mitigate and reduce a lot of the unknowns, I think is great. And and then you know you're not going to be able to do everything and anything, right? But if you, even if you, I hear you're saying, just set up some goals. I want to do some, connect with X number of new people, potential clients. I want to go to a couple of sessions that are a little bit outside of my area of expertise. I want to have some open free time so that some unexpected spontaneous moments can happen. But as event professionals are 
uh, really expanding the events to such a broad scope of engagement, whether it's in the breakout sessions, the general sessions, the coffee breaks, the receptions, all sorts of activations. Um, as the attendee, as you say, it's a two-way street. So we both have to do the homework beforehand, create a little bit of a plan, and at the same time, bring bring ourselves forth to, to get the most out of it, you know? Victoria, staying on the same question, but turning it on its head a little bit, how then are, you know, knowing the psychology of attendees going in, not everybody's going to be the perfect attendee doing the homework beforehand, literally mapping it out and making goals. Some might do it a little bit by memory or by instinct. But on the other side of the coin, understanding that psychology of the attendees, how does that influence the design and the execution of successful event experiences made by, produced by these event professionals? I think a lot of uh, science-based solutions that event professionals can use, they revolve around invisible things, things okay. that are not obviously uh, linked to the success of the event. Invisible and, things uh, like they're not they are not right in our view? Invisible things in a way that they, there is no direct connection between you know, that factor, the outcomes. So let me give you an example. There was a study um, recently done and they found that uh, people like a speaker and their content more when they listen to them via headphones and not via speakers. So the organizers can change that and ask people to wear headphones and just because of this tweak, you potentially influence how the speaker is perceived and you potentially influence the outcomes of the content delivered, right? Did they find that with the headphones, people paid more attention or distinctive they, difference? Uh, Yes, they tested how speaker was perceived. And so people, when they listened to a speaker by headphones, they found they perceived speaker as a warmer person and they felt more empathy towards the speaker. I'm wondering if that's because the audio was physically that much closer to them and it was yes. almost like, you know, a bedtime story or something, you know. Uh, yes, there are a couple of reasons why it happens, and researchers, they kind of discuss that in a paper, but it's a good example of how not obvious thing can improve the outcomes. You see what I mean? Sure. It's, it, it is because it's not really obvious or uh, well known that you can do this and receive a better outcomes yeah. for your speakers, right? Yeah. And so a lot of science-based solutions are like that. And then, you know, some some things that come from research, from, from studies, they can give you some creative ideas. We talk a lot about the influence, the impact of nature on people's well-being, uh, people's mood, right? And um, there was a report recently discussing how people in general, are realizing the power of connecting with nature and consequently their behavior changes. So this understanding can lead to all sorts of creative ideas for event professionals. Like, for example, instead of networking breaks, we can introduce networking hikes, right? Why not? Or right. you can do some biophilic design, meaning that you have uh, you can have some uh, nature inspired elements in the event space. So this is how again ideas can be sparked due to understanding what science teaches us about people's behavior and mind. We're talking about networking, by the way, again, we know that people are social creatures and we are wired to connect. But how come that networking and events is considered one of the toughest things to do um, for everyone? Yeah. 
for everyone, right? Uh, regardless of their status, how self-confident they are, it's a tough thing to do. And I think, again, it happens because human psychology has not been the focus. So we need to think more about what's going on in the mind when people think or attempt to network, right? And um, if we think about that, then we realize that many feel fear of rejection, Many experience social fatigue or sensory overload that I just mentioned. And these are individual factors. Then you add social factors. What are the perceived norms and encouraging behavior at this event? Are uh, organizers communicating these norms to their audience? Uh, then you add environmental factors. Is the space conducive to effective networking at all? Are there zones or comfortable seating that signal that this is the place to interact, to communicate, to start a conversation. And now when you look at networking uh, from this angle, then you uh, start to come up again with ideas based on human psychology. Okay, what if we have conference buddy for those who are attending first time? Or what if we create quiet zones? What if we add networking tips and reminders in the um, pre-event communication? And again, you know, I think most of the things that I just mentioned, you probably have already experienced it and many organizers do this more often. But my point is that it's not new insights. No, science uh, has known this for, for a long time. So we, event professionals, could have benefited from, from uh, we, event professionals, could have benefited from it much earlier. And that's my yeah. point. So uh, the same applies basically for the current and future insights. So if you are not following up right now, if you are not in the know, then you are missing out. Yeah. What one of the guests we've had on our podcast is Liz Lathan, who is very involved with engaging in new creative ways and breaking the mold, breaking the past, creating new new methods. And, you know, her her message is just that, you know, create an environment that's conducive, have some fire starters, meaning, you know, not just a dark bar with loud music and, hey, how can you have a meaningful connection and meaningful conversation? Maybe, but highly likely overall, it's not optimal, right? Another guest that we've had on the show on our, on our podcast is a gentleman who works in the world of health and well-being. And a popular topic is grounding, where literally when you travel and you get to a place, you get into bare feet and you put your feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking maybe we could bring in uh, grass, like real grass, like sod, and have an area where you have to take your shoes off, have a little cubby hole or whatever for people to put their shoes, and they can just stand on grass or even some pebbles, you know, because it activates the neurons that are at the bottom of your feet. And that could be another way. It's also a conversation starter. And you don't yeah. have to leave a big convention center. You can have a little, you know, five square meters or something. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of space, but it's an area where you can connect with nature in a, in a very particular kind of way. So absolutely. I love this idea. Let, let's take that forward because I know Victoria, you love to go to the coast and love to be near the water and, and connect with nature and okay. Unfortunately, not every either hotel meeting room or convention center has uh, easy access to those kind of spaces to go out and connect with that much ease, you know. But we do make activities available for attendees to go play golf or go on other types of even shopping trips. Why not, as you said, a hike and, and, and with the intention of having the context be, you know, networking or meaningfully connect with people that, uh, you know, you can, you can engage with for your work. Uh, you know, it's a different kind of way to do it. Absolutely. That's cool. Let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, you know, you, you have a, you have an online course, the event psychology workshop and training. And, you know, you, you refer not only to this podcast, but ongoingly, I follow you on social media, you refer to your, and, and you leverage your behavioral research and 
neuroscience and the insights that come along with it. And really, you're, you're, you're addressing these challenges that these event professionals face and deal with and tolerate and grapple with and, and struggle with and wrestle with for return on investment, bringing value to the attendees, constantly trying to find new ways to engage and activate attendees. If I were an event professional participating in, in your event psychology lab, what are some of the things that you would say are valuable for them to come in that they're going to get, that they're going to be able to use? Uh, so this is a course for those that are just starting out with event psychology approach. Okay. And I recommend it um, because it covers all the basic concepts, all the basic principles, and it shows practical ways uh, to apply it to event design and marketing. And so it's about three hours course, uh, short videos with a lot of examples, some case studies, uh, some tests even, small experiments that you can try on yourself. And um, I also provide a, a list of research papers that um, I use uh, throughout the So in case you need to convince someone on your team or your boards to try and experience the new solutions, then you have, I, I've got you covered, you have this research cited and you can use it uh, and, and share with your team as well. So that's uh, what it is about. I think for anybody starting out, you know, it's important to know about food and beverage or health protocols, security, um, negotiating hotels, creating an agenda, attendee registration. As an event planner who's just starting out in the industry and wanting to get trained and understand an important part of planning and creating an event in a professional manner, the psychology of the attendee and everybody involved in the whole ecosystem is of utmost importance. You can be a great person at negotiating hotels and food and beverage and an agenda and booking speakers. But underneath that, if the foundation of understanding the, the psychology and the behavior, the human behavior behind these events the attendees, participants, the creators, and all the vendors involved, you're going to have a leg up in your career. And when you're going to um, create or propose an idea, you'll be able to inhabit those um, distinctions of human, human psychology in events that are really going to uh, make a difference for everybody involved, including yourself in your own career. Absolutely. And I would add here, you know, uh, one of my favorite quotes is by behavioral scientist Richard Chataway. And he says, if you're in business, you're in business of behavior. And I cannot think of any other industry that is more about people than events and hospitality and tourism, right? So even if you are a seasoned event professional, you have to learn more about human behavior and mind if you want your job to become easier and if you want success for your events. Because we all know it's uh, it's tough times. Marketing budgets are cut. Events are uh, facing a lot of challenges and pressure, right? And so event professionals are tasked with finding some out-of-box solutions. And I can assure you that science-based solutions are very low-key but high-impact. So it doesn't matter if you are an experienced event professional or just starting out in the industry. This area of expertise is something that everyone needs. I love that. If you are, say it again, if you are in business. If you're in business, you're in business of behavior. If you are in business, you are in the business of behavior. I just, I just love that because it's so true. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's the studying of it, but then there's the applying of it or really habiting it. So it becomes second nature so that you don't have to intellectually think about it. And then I have to operate this way. It's more like, okay, I understand this. This is going to be my approach. And I just love that because it's so true. Any business, any industry, that's a really, really great. And, you know, the course, um, 
I've taken a look at it on your website. It looks so rich and, and so full of, of the science-based information. And, uh, you know, I couldn't recommend it more strongly to anybody in the industry that wants to get informed and educated on, um, on these topics. As a professional, h- how do you stay on top of what's new and fresh, you know, with research, with insights, getting informed? But more importantly, how do you then take that and whether you make it your own or, or dial it in for event professionals today? Well, I stay in the know by following scientists, by reading books written by researchers, by listening to podcasts. And I uh, utilize my experience in events because I used to be an event planner myself to connect those two fields together and to translate from science language into events language, as I say. Yeah. And that, and that's the gift in the art, Victoria, is that that translation, you take the professional scientific material that can be uh, overwhelming or a little bit intimidating in its science language, and then you interpret it and translate it and make it digestible for us. And you know, that's the richness of what you do because you've been an event professional and you're taking now your the scientific expertise that you're trained in and really uh, such a treasure trove of riches and resource for us to make the events uh, better, optimal, and um, have our attendees flourish and thrive because of it. So just thank you. I think that that's a good place to end I want to know where the, the research takes us. So we might have a, another visit with you on the podcast. Uh, we're all busy. You've carved time out of your day. You're, you've been thoughtful in your answers, always coming well prepared and engaged. So just thank you for your generosity of spirit. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome, Victoria. And I hope you get out to the coast and are able to, you know, engage with the water and the coastline and the nature as much as possible because I know how important that is to you. I will certainly do. (laughs) Yes, for sure. Um, For our listeners, thank you for coming back. For our new listeners, thank you for giving us a shot. We appreciate you being here. We know you're smarter for it. We'll see you next time.